Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Being Well, a program that strives to create consciousness and awareness in the world and wants to make a positive and meaningful contribution to humanity. I'm Anjali and I'll be your host. Today we have a whole bunch of health related questions and answers for you. Firstly, we have Julie Schiffman who's going to teach us how to get a relief from anger through tapping. Then Alia will show us how to make a delicious Moroccan chicken domicili. After that, Courtney Bell is going to demonstrate some great yoga exercise. Lastly, we have Nicola and Stefan who's going to tell us how it's like having achondroplasia, a form of dwarfism. So stop all your other activities and be with us for the next one hour. Do you have a short fuse or find yourself getting into frequent arguments or fights? Anger is a normal healthy emotion. But when chronic, anger spirals out of control. It can have serious consequences for your relationship, your health and your state of mind. To avoid this in one way, we have EFT practitioner Julie Schiffman who is going to tell us or teach us how to get a relief from anger through tapping. Let's have a look. Hi, I'm Julie Schiffman, and today we're going to tap on anger and how it can really have such a powerful effect on your body and your health. I see so many people who are angry and resentful about a variety of things, most things that they have no control over, and they just can't seem to get over it. I was thinking about this recently as I was on vacation with my family. My husband and I planned a wonderful vacation to California with our three kids. We were all so excited about it and planned to stay at a well-known, reputable hotel. Well, when we got there, we went to our room and it had all sorts of problems. Without going into details, I wasn't happy with it. On top of the room issues, the hotel was doing some renovations and we could hear the construction going on. We went to the front desk and told them this room had some major problems and we wanted another room. We were paying a lot of money for it and we wanted to be comfortable for the week we were there. Well, they told us that the hotel was totally booked and there was nothing we could do. They were apologetic, but still we were stuck with this hotel room and it made me feel angry and frustrated. We thought about changing hotels, but there were five of us and it wasn't so easy and my husband was just as happy to make it work. For some reason, I was so angry about it. Angry with the hotel, angry with the circumstances. After all, this was my vacation and I wanted to be comfortable, if not perfect. I was also angry with my husband because he didn't really care as much as I did and I wanted him to be angry too. Now, I tap regularly, daily, for all sorts of things, big and small. I even thought about tapping about it, but I didn't because I wanted others to know I was mad, and I guess I was going to make others suffer along with me. I wanted them to be as mad as I was. It doesn't make much sense, does it? Especially because no one else was angry. So why am I sharing this with you today? Because I literally made myself sick about it. Four days into our trip, I got a terrible virus, and I don't get sick often. In fact, I can't remember the last time I was sick. Started with a stomach virus, and it moved to a sore throat and a really bad cold. I was a complete mess for the last couple days of our vacation. So after many years of tapping on myself and teaching others how to tap, it looks like I still have some work to do. I share this with you because I want you to think about something that makes you angry, something that you keep replaying in your head over and over, and you just can't seem to let it go. You want everyone to know, or maybe you keep it to yourself. Either way, you are the only one who is suffering here. Just like me, no one else cared, and they made the best of it. I suffered and only hurt myself in the process. Anger could very well be making you sick, whether you have physical symptoms now or maybe something is brewing. Don't hold on to it. You're only hurting yourself on so many levels. So again, think of something that makes you angry and resentful, something you just can't seem to let go of. Maybe because you're right and you know you're right. Or maybe you have really been wronged here and you deserve to be this angry. Maybe you need this anger so you don't give in again. This can be something as recent as today or something from years back. I want you to rate this anger on the scale of 0 to 10. Really feel it in your body. Notice where it is and how intense it is for you. And let's start tapping. We're going to tap a couple of different rounds about this. First for the anger that you do express, but you feel you're not heard. And then we're going to tap for feeling angry, but holding it inside. As always, please remember to take responsibility for your own emotional and physical well-being. If this feels hard for you to do on your own, reach out for help. 
and we're gonna start tapping on the side of the hand and repeat after me. Even though I am so angry about this situation, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Even though I am so mad and I just can't seem to let this go. I don't wanna let this go. They were wrong and I am right and I'm angry about it. I love and accept how I feel about this. Even though I know I'm making myself sick about this. I can't stop thinking about it and I'm replaying it in my mind over and over again. Sometimes even making up the dialogue to make it more intense. I choose to honor all of my feelings about this because I know I'm justified in feeling this way. I am so angry. I am so angry about this. And I deserve to be angry about this. This is just wrong. I am right and I want everyone to know I'm right. So I'm gonna stew about this. I'm gonna let everyone know how angry I am. But it feels like nobody is listening. Why doesn't anybody care? I am bubbling over with anger. I feel like they really don't understand me. I really feel wronged here. I hate that I can't control this situation. Isn't anyone listening to me? I am just bursting with anger. I told them how I felt. I yelled it actually, so I know they heard me, but they don't get it. Can't stop thinking about it. It's exhausting me. I wonder if I can let this go. They are not honoring how I feel, but I wonder if I can. It feels good just to get this out. I just wanna scream. I don't wanna let this go because then I'm letting them off the hook and I will not let them off the hook. But are they really suffering here? Or am I just hurting myself? This anger is like me drinking poison and hoping the other person will suffer from it. It's only hurting me. Maybe I can relax about this a little bit. It just feels good to get it out and listen to how I feel. At least one person is listening. I wonder if I can see this differently. Maybe I am right in my own way, but maybe I can see things another way too. I'm honoring how I feel, and sometimes that can be enough. For my own health, I'm open to letting go, for my own sake. I wanna feel at peace again. Even if I can't totally resolve this with someone else, I can resolve it within myself. I choose to talk to myself like I might talk to an angry child in order to soothe them. I might tell them it'll be okay because it will be. I might tell them to take some 
big deep breaths to get centered. I might tell them that I love them. I love me enough to let go. Just letting go, just for now, so I can think clearly. I'll figure this out. I'm a smart person, I usually do. I enter how I feel. I'm starting to feel calmer, more relaxed. My body is relaxing. Peace. Take a big deep breath in and breathe it out and check in and see how this feels. If you're still feeling an intense amount of anger, then go back and do it again. Hopefully you're feeling calmer, but tap on whatever seems to be coming up for you. We're gonna do another round here for stuffing the anger inside. Internalizing the anger can feel pretty intense when it's all bottled up and eventually it just explodes. Not only does it just feel bad, it can really cause your body to respond in some painful ways and it can cause all sorts of problems for you. I cannot express the importance of letting go and allowing forgiveness into your life. So again, think about someone or something making you angry. Really feel it in your body and notice where it is. And let's tap again. Even though I'm so angry, but I'm having a hard time expressing it, I love and accept myself. Even though I'm fuming inside, I'm really burning with anger and rage. I'm willing to accept and honor how I feel about this. Even though I am so angry, but I'm afraid to express it for fear that I won't be taken seriously, or I fear that I'll be judged for it, or I won't be loved or accepted because of it, I love, accept, and forgive myself. I am really angry right now. I am so angry, but I can't express it. I learned a long time ago that it's not safe to express my emotions. Maybe I won't be taken seriously. Someone will be mad at me if I show my anger. I hate conflict. But I'm really mad right now. This is a real dilemma for me because I just want to yell and scream and let this person know how I feel. But it's too risky. So I stuff it down. I don't want to fight about it. So I tend to be passive and aggressive about it. I will ignore them. I'll be cold or avoid them. But I'm really stewing about this. It's starting to make me feel bad. I can even feel it in my body. I can feel it in my shoulder, my back, my stomach, headaches. It's so hard for me to let them know how I feel. but I'm justified in feeling this way. Then I wonder why it's so hard for me to own my power and speak up for myself. I just can't risk them being mad at me too. It feels like I have the power when I'm angry. I have the upper hand. But I don't really because no one even knows I'm mad. It is so much wasted energy and I keep thinking about it over and over again. I'm actually getting tired of thinking about it. I don't really want to hold on to this anymore. It's really affecting our relationship. 
Maybe it's time for a change. To either let it go or confront this person. I'm choosing to own my power. And I do have the power to either express myself or let it go. I am safe either way. To really step up and step into myself. Anger is just an emotion. Sometimes it can feel scary, but I'm safe. Releasing it from my body. I have to let this go for my own health and well being. My body feels calmer, more relaxed as I figure this out. I honor all my emotions and tell the truth about how I feel. Peace. Take another big deep breath in and out. And think about what or who was making you so angry. Chances are you thought about many different things while you were tapping. Maybe even some childhood, childhood stuff came up for you. Maybe you're thinking about how to get revenge, which only creates more anger. Who taught you that it's not okay to be angry and express yourself? This script is just a way to get you started. Change the words if you need to, or start tapping on your own for some of the things that came up for you. Whatever you do, keep tapping until you don't feel a charge about this anymore. Although it is okay to feel angry and honor it, it is just as important to see it as a way to learn more about yourself and what triggers you so that you can finally let go. You deserve it. Welcome back. Healthy eating does not mean depriving yourselves of the food you love. It is all about having a well-maintained balanced diet and a good relationship with your food. So here is Alia from Cooking with Alia who's going to show us how to make one of her favorite Moroccan dishes, Sva Midfuna. Let's have a look. Dalia, the show that brings you the flavors of Morocco. Today I'm going to show you how to make one of my favorite Moroccan dishes, sfa with chicken or sfa midfuna. Sfa can be made with couscous grains, rice or vermicelli, which is a very fine pasta. Midfuna literally means buried, and that's because the sfa is presented in a dome and the meat is buried inside. It could be chicken, lamb or beef. We also add um, dried fruits and it's uh, decorated with powdered sugar and ground cinnamon. Oh yum! It's super easy to make, just follow the recipe and the video step by step and I promise you're going to have one of the most memorable dishes of your life. So let's start! For the chicken, I'm using around 2 pounds of uh, drumsticks, which is around uh, 1 kilograms. Then I have 3 medium uh, onions, grated. And here I have a quarter of a cup of finely chopped cilantro and a quarter of a cup of finely chopped parsley. For the spices, we will need one teaspoon of ground ginger, half a teaspoon of salt, a quarter of a teaspoon of black pepper, and a quarter of a teaspoon of ground uh, turmeric, and also a small pinch of saffron threads. And then we have uh, two cinnamon sticks. For the oils, I like to use one tablespoon of olive oil and one tablespoon of vegetable oil. I like to mix them. And then I have a half teaspoon of smin. Smin is basically ghee, which is clarified butter. In a saucepan, on medium heat, drizzle the olive oil and the vegetable oil. Add the grated onions, add the spices, and the chicken. Now we're going to cover the pan and let the chicken cook for around 5 minutes to absorb all the flavors of uh, the onion and uh, the spices. It's on medium heat, cover it and just let it sit here for 5 minutes. After 2 minutes, um, just turn the chicken around so both sides get to absorb the spices and also add the 2 cinnamon sticks. I forgot to add them when I was uh, pouring the spices. So cover your pan and continue cooking for another 2 or 3 minutes until both sides absorb uh, the spices. We're going to add the rest of the ingredients which is the parsley and cilantro and the smin. 
which is the clarified butter. So mix all the ingredients. So now I'm going to add a little bit of uh, water just so that my chicken cooks. Increase your heat to medium high because we want the juices to start boiling. Cover your pan and cook the chicken until done. It will take around uh, maybe 40 minutes so we'll check on it as it cooks. After 15 minutes of cooking the chicken, check on it and make sure it has enough water. Now we'll have to add a little bit of water. This is the perfect water level. You don't want it to be completely covering the chicken, just half covering the chicken. The chicken has been cooking for 30 minutes. It's done. So depending on the temperature on the chicken you use, uh, it may differ from 30 to 40 minutes. But the chicken is so soft, it's ready, it smells amazing. And now what we're going to do is remove the chicken from the sauce and place the chicken in a bowl and let the sauce reduce until we get this thick and silky sauce. I took the sauce on high heat for around 8 minutes and look how thick and silky it became. This is great. This is what we want. So right now I'm going to turn off the heat and I'm going to put the chicken back and we'll just leave it here until we're ready to serve. So for the dried fruits I have a blanched whole almonds, I have uh, walnuts, half walnuts, I'm going to use them for decoration. Then I have uh, dates, Ooh, I love dates. Uh, what I did with the dates is first I removed the pits of course because you don't want people to eat the dates and then find the pit inside. And then I put them in um, hot water for half an hour. This way they soften up before we steam them. And here I have raisins. Same thing with the raisins, put them in hot water for half an hour before steaming them. So what we're going to do is steam the raisins and the dates, we steam them, and we fry the almonds. The walnuts, you don't have to do anything, we'll just use them as decoration at the end. To fry the almond, first heat uh, the oil, it's vegetable oil, on a flat pan. Then just place all your almonds in here. And we're going to fry them for a few minutes until they become golden brown. Our almonds are almost ready. They're getting this really nice deep golden color. I'm going to wait for another minute and remove them from the hot oil. As I remove the almonds, I'm going to place them directly on a plate covered with a paper towel. This way it absorbs any excess oil. Pat the almonds like this so all excess oil is gone. So just put half of your almonds in here, put a little bit of powdered sugar and then orange blossom water and just pulse it. Don't mix the almonds too much because we don't want them to become powdery. It's more like medium-sized chunks and this way we can get this crunchiness. Ooh, yum. For the raisins and dates, I'm going to basically steam them. I'm just going to use a sieve here and I have uh, water that's going to start boiling soon. So we're going to leave the dates and raisins to steam and we'll check on them from time to time. The dates and raisins have been steaming for 15 minutes. They're super soft. So we turn off the heat and leave them here until we're ready to serve. We've prepared the chicken, we've prepared all the ingredients for the dry fruit. So all we have to do now is steam the vermicelli. Here, this is vermicelli. It's basically very thin pasta um, cut in small pieces and basically this is um, the package I'm using here. We're going to steam the vermicelli into two times. Sometimes it takes three but usually two. First, we're going to cover them with vegetable oil and mix them with vegetable oil to get the fats they need. The thing is, I don't use just any vegetable oil. I use the vegetable oil where I fried my almonds because now my vegetable oil has this like nutty flavor which is super cool. Keep the oil and use it to rub the vermicelli. And do it softly, not to break the pasta. In the bottom part of my couscous pot, I added hot water and I'm going to add half a lemon um, in the water. Then place the top part of the couscous pot and add the vermicelli on top. We're going to cover and cook this on medium-high heat until you start seeing steam coming out from the top of the couscous pot. This is our first steaming. So we're going to take um, the vermicelli from here, pour some salted water on it and steam it again. Place the vermicelli in a large plate. Now I'm going to pour on the vermicelli half a cup of water with half teaspoon of salt and just fluff it around. We're going to let the vermicelli rest on the plate for around 5 minutes before putting it back in the couscous pot and steaming it again. This is the second steaming and you can see steam coming out again. It took around 10 minutes. 
it needs a little bit more cooking. So I continued cooking my vermicelli for another five minutes. I just tasted it. It's a little bit uh, still al dente for me, not uh, cooked yet. So I'm going to do a third steaming. So you really have to taste and uh, work with your vermicelli. You may only need two steaming, steamings or three steamings. For the third steaming, we're doing the same thing. Put the vermicelli in the large plate. I'm going to add half a cup of water, not salty water because I tasted the vermicelli, it's salty, so it's fine. And let the vermicelli rest for five minutes in the plate. I steamed the vermicelli for the third time for around five minutes, and now it's ready. Put it in a bowl and fluff it with butter. Mmm. The vermicelli is ready, and now let's plate this dish. The first thing is I'm going to mix the raisins with the vermicelli. First, place a little bit of the vermicelli at the bottom like that around your plate, then place the chicken pieces on top of the vermicelli. Cover the chicken pieces with the sauce, with the really thick and juicy sauce, and also put a little bit on the vermicelli at the bottom. And now, place the rest of the vermicelli on top of the chicken to create a dome. For decoration, we're going to use the almonds, the dates, and the walnuts. First, I'm going to put a little bit of the almonds that I crushed with um, sugar and orange blossom water on the top, like this. And also put a little bit around. And now I'm going to decorate with the whole almonds. On the other side I'm going to add the dates and the walnuts. We decorate the sofa with powdered sugar and ground cinnamon, but just put a little bit. This way people can add more if they want more. Some people don't like too much sugar, so um, just put a little bit for decoration. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed this recipe. You could of course change the recipe to make it simpler, so you don't have to have all the dried fruits. You can have just the vermicelli and the chicken if you want a simple dinner. But I wanted to show you how beautiful and elaborate it could be. And I can't wait to eat this. Bon appétit! That seems to be a great dish. Take some time and make this perfect dish for a perfect dinner. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back after a short break. Welcome back. Yoga has never been an alien to us. It's our way of life. We have been doing yoga since we were a baby. Whether it's a cat stretch that strengthens the spine or the wind relieving pose that boosts the digestion. We see kids doing yoga one way or the other. Today we have Courtney Bell to demonstrate us some simple energizing yoga routine. So grab your yoga mat and let's do some yoga. Hey everyone, my name is Courtney and thank you for watching this morning yoga video for beginners. It's a series of 10 different yoga postures that you can flow through any time of the morning, noon or night that you feel like you need a little bit of morning yoga energy. So feel free to please favorite this video and watch it over and over. If there's a posture that doesn't feel comfortable for you or a movement that causes any sort of aches or pains, just let the video run and resume to a posture that feels good for you to practice. So we're going to begin in a cross-legged seat on the ground. You can bring your hands to your knees and again, if you need to put a cushion under your hips, you just create a little chair for yourself, slide block, cushion, blanket, and sit back down so you have some elevation. Especially in the morning, our joints and muscles can be kind of tight, so we want to create a sense of ease in your lower body so that it can be stable for you to enter into your practice. So hands resting on top of your knees, so just take a moment to inhale through your nose so that you're filling your lungs from the bottom the middle all the way to the top 
and then we open the mouth to exhale. And a couple more times, inhaling through your nose and exhaling through your mouth. Inhaling and exhaling. So now we've generated this initial flow of breath. We're going to move our body, exhaling, dipping gently over to your right. And then inhaling, come up to center. Deep breath, full lung capacity. Exhale, dip over to your left side. And inhale, coming up to center. So enjoy this sway from your right side, exhaling and inhaling back over to your left side a few times, warming up the length of your spine. Also warming up movement and stability in your hips and in your shoulders. And then let's find center and drop your chin down to your chest. Exhaling here, and roll your right ear over your right shoulder, entering into some gentle neck rolls. Drop your chin back down to the center, and roll your left ear over your left shoulder. And enjoy a few rounds circulating your head. Even though this movement is isolated in your neck and your head, notice that the rest of your body responds to the movement and it really travels the whole length of your spine. So enjoy as the movement begins to flow on your breath through your body. And we'll come back to center. Take a deep breath in as you draw your shoulders and elbows back, lifting your chest, lifting your chin, and exhale. Draw the front of your spine into your body, tailbone forward, and crown of your head forward as if you were creating a circle. Inhale opening through your chest and your throat and exhale drawing into the front of your body once again inhale and exhale nice for our second posture we're going to come down into boat pose so this is where you might want to put a blanket underneath your bum if you're feeling a little tender. We're going to modify our first boat pose by bringing our hands under our knees and just rocking back with our upper body a little bit so you feel the support resting in your center. So there shouldn't be any strain at this point. And then balancing on your sitting bones and your tailbone, we're going to lift your feet up so they're in line with your knees. You can keep holding behind your knees if that helps you find your center. And you can also extend your arms forward. So in boat pose, we're generating a lot of core abdominal energy and focus. From boat pose, we rock down into half boat pose. So you're rolling onto your sacrum and extending your feet out as you hover your shoulders over the ground. You're gonna inhale up into boat and exhale into half boat. This just generates a lot of fiery energy in your body and starts to get your breath into 
a good rhythm with your movements. So we'll do about eight of these and then come all the way up. So we're gonna rock up to sitting and then place your hands in front of you. Step your feet back into plank pose. In plank pose, your hands are under your shoulders, all 10 fingers stretched out nice and wide. Toes are hooked under so you're on the balls of your feet. And let's sway from your right side to your left side here. This is warming up your arms and your chest and also keeping that energy we cultivated in your abdomen. The breath is still flowing. From plank pose, you're gonna lower your knees onto the mat and sit back for camel pose. Camel is a beginner back bend that we do standing on our shins. So if this is uncomfortable for your knees, I want you to place a blanket underneath your knees and your feet so you have some extra cushion. You can either have your toes tucked or have your toes pointed straight back. So we're not gonna go into a deep variation of camel since this is morning energy. But we are going to find some strength to extend our spine and open our heart. Take your hands behind your body, place them on your hips. So you want to keep your hips directly over your knees and not let them fall back towards your heels in this pose. Hips are directly over your knees. Knees are hip width apart hands for support behind you. Draw your elbows back so you widen the space between your upper arms and give some room for your chest to rise. Take a breath in and fill up your lung capacity again and gently exhale. Again, inhale lifting your heart away from your hips, straight up towards the sky, and exhale. One more breath, inhaling deeply, and exhale. We'll come back to your hands and your knees, toes tucked. Lift your hips behind you, but keep your knees deeply bent so that your chest presses to the top of your thighs. Downward dog. From this position, you can begin to pedal out your heels one at a time. So while one knee is deeply bent, your other leg extends long. Bend your knee. And then reach out and back through your opposite heel. Bending your knee, reaching out and back. Nice. From downward dog, step your feet forward to the top of your mat. Inhaling your chest away from your thighs and exhaling forward fold. From your forward fold, gently roll your spine up to stand. You can stretch your arms open to the sky, lifting your heart straight up. And exhale, draw your hands into prayer position in front of your heart. 
Find a comfortable, steady, easy breath. From standing, bring your feet together. Drop your hands down as you bend your knees and see if you can touch your fingertips to the floor. Then draw your hands back by your hips. Establish your seat, your core, and the length of your spine as you inhale, swinging your arms up alongside your ears. You're gonna find chair pose for a few breaths, feeling your individual legs planted into the ground and all that energy burning through your calves, through your thighs, through your hips, and through your lower abdomen for the rest of your body and your mind and your life. From here, simply fold forward keeping your knees bent, hands to the ground, and let your head fall over your pose. From your forward fold, keep your right foot where it is and step your left foot straight back into a lunge. We're gonna pivot your back heel into your mat and rise for warrior one, drawing your arms by your hips and then extending up through your spine. Take a few deep breaths here, using the energy of your legs to plant down into the ground and rise up through your body. Exhale, return your hands, step back forward into a forward fold and switch with your right foot stepping back. Drop your heel down and inhale, standing up into warrior one. Chest rises directly over your hips and your hips square towards the front of the mat. So we'll have another video. You can check in to get the full instruction for these standing asanas, warrior one included. Exhale, bring your hands back down into a lunge and return your feet to the top of your mat. Exhale, have a seat behind your heels. <clears throat> and we'll draw your right knee into your chest as your left leg is long in front of you for a gentle twist. Notice my foot here is not directly against my thigh, but my foot is about a fist width between my extended leg. I'm gonna to twist towards my right knee and take my left hand around my thigh. And then I'm gonna unwind with my left hand behind my left leg, fingertips pointed away from my body. Now shift onto the pinky toe edge of your left foot and extend your right arm up and over. Return your hips down to the ground. If you'd like to swing back into the twist. And again, left hand behind you. Roll up onto the pinky toe edge of your left foot. And exhale, come back down. One more time, twisting. And then inhale. Rise up and over. So we have two sides, switch with your left knee forward, your right foot extended and twist over your left thigh. As you unwind, you'll take your right hand behind your hips, 
fingers pointed away from you. Rock onto the little toe edge of your right foot and lift your body off of your mat. Exhale. Return to a twist. Inhale. Extend up and over. Good morning. Stretch. Exhale. Twist out all the stagnation from the day and night before. Inhale. Open up into something fresh. All right. Hope you're feeling good after that. We're pretty much ready to come to the close. So just feeling all the energy that you generated through your entire body all the way out through your hands and through your feet. You're going to bring your hands together. Prayer at your heart. Taking a deep breath in and exhaling. You could choose to spring up for your day. You can also choose to sit in a meditation. And you can also choose to lay down flat, finding Shavasana. At some point in your day, you're going to want to find all three of those points. So choose which is appropriate for you right now. Get up and go. Rest in Shavasana or sit and meditate. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed the morning routine and feel free to leave me a comment. Let me know how you liked the postures, how you like me as an instructor and how you like this video presentation. I would love to hear from you. Um, you can follow along with me at yogacurrent.com. Again, my name is Courtney Bell. And also please subscribe to Psyche Truth. Hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you for watching again. Namaste. That was really a great exercise. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Since we had a great workout, we'll have a short break and be right back. Welcome back. Have you ever been in a shopping mall or in a college campus and seen a person who appears to be in grade school but when taken a closer look seems to be a lot older? A child with dwarfism is born in every 10,000 births and 80% of the people with dwarfism have average height parents and siblings. Here is Nicola and Stefan who's going to tell us how it's like having achondroplasia, a form of dwarfism and how they deal with it. What's this? My name is Nicola. I live in Manchester and I work for the BBC here in Manchester. Me and Nicola have known each other for six years this year. Um, I'm originally from Denmark, so I was born and raised in Denmark. and and I did actually move over to England to be with, with her. So obviously that was a big step for me and all that. Because we live in an average height world, not, not everything can be adapted to us. That would be kind of crazy really. So we therefore have to adapt to the world. So that means, um, you know, we've just bought a house, so we've moved into our house and um, we'd have to make adaptions such as we've got a stool in the kitchen so we can reach uh, the sink, um, I have a car, and in order to be able to drive that car, we have pedal extensions. So this is um, our hired car for now, and we've got like these pedals that are like uh, kind of clip-on ones. Uh, very straightforward, it takes like five, ten minutes. Uh, and then what I have as well is I just have got like a cushion that I put on here just to put me a bit forward. Uh, so it's very nice and simple really, and then I'm just, I can go off. To that extent, it's really easy to, to adapt yourself to the world and it doesn't, you almost do it in your second nature. You know, you throw in a kick stool and you're fine. If, if I had to say that my biggest problem, it would be stereotyping. Um, I don't feel in any way disadvantaged in terms of in employment or uh, I haven't in education or in society in terms of socialising. But I would say people's biggest ignorance is 
that they expect me to be like the people that they that are stereotyped on the television? I think the the main stereotypes that we see that are, that I don't really find that um, good for, for, for dwarves and, and myself is the kind you see on television that kind of bounce around and, and do silly things to just be like a laughing stock really for people to look at and laugh and all that. So when people see us out on the streets sometimes, they don't see us as human beings. They think, oh, well, it's okay to laugh and, and point. Um, and I think that's very different to another dis- other disabilities. I think, you know, if you saw somebody in a wheelchair, you wouldn't, you wouldn't laugh at them. Um, and I think that it can only go, my only explanation of that, that it does go back to comical stereotyping of dwarfism in in the media. If there's people that are going to go on programmes and be a court jester or be a clown, especially on children's television, then children are going to grow up and might only actually ever see a dwarf in that role and may never meet a dwarf as a friend or in a pub or in a different environment. Um, and I think... In a way, my own community doesn't do itself many favours by taking on those roles. I think in terms of whether I fit into a stereotype, I'd say n- no, um, definitely not. Um, you know, I have a job that lots of other people that are average height or that, you know, are perceived as normal um, have. Well, my average life is, is probably very uh, similar to, to, to your average life and other people's average life in that. I do sports um, on a daily, not daily basis, but a weekly basis, you might say. And um, I go shopping when I need to go shopping. I go uh, out to buy clothes when I need to buy clothes. I go out with mates, have a drink, have a laugh, go to the cinema, watch a movie, go to the theatre. You know, we want the same as everybody else. I want children and I, you know, I want to kind of um, have that, the same life that everybody wants. So I would say, no, I definitely don't fit into the stereotype of running around a stage with makeup on. As a dwarf, one of the things that I'm really interested in that we take part in is sports. Um, and I think it's it's to show that we can do sport just the same as everybody else. And when I was young, there wasn't really a channel for if you had a talent in sport, there was nowhere to go really. Um, so um, there was an organisation set up called the Dwarf Athletic Association. And basically that's their main... Um, objective is to make sport accessible to dwarfs and make allow dwarfs to be able to compete on an equal footing. So we have our annual games um, in Birmingham um, and there's about 100 athletes that come together every year and compete on all different levels but we're starting to get much more elite athletes um, that compete in field events, track events, swimming, um, and then we have team sports like hockey and basketball. I did some uh, shot put uh, and actually was getting quite involved with, with shot put on a kind of, you might say professional level. It was still like amateur level because it wasn't getting money for it, but I was um, getting involved like with, with, with kind of Paralympic standards and getting into like records and starting to like build for like if you want to go to Paralympics. The self-esteem that that gives a a teenager particularly with dwarfism who you know might feel a little bit left out of school or might feel a little bit um you know different when they go to our games they can compete and win a gold medal and achieve at something which in terms of sport they never thought they would achieve that higher level um so it gives them real great confidence and a real kind of sense of worth really and they go back to school feeling very proud of themselves and I think that's one of the most important things about the organisation, really. Some people are surprised to hear that average height people have dwarf children. Um, but of course they do, because dwarf children don't just, you know, we're not just born under trees. Um, so, and that can sometimes be hard for parents to come to terms with the fact that their child is different. My parents were very um, accepted from the start, I think. From what I can understand, they were very accepted from my, me being small and all like that. Still didn't mean that they didn't obviously ask questions and I was like worried about me because they were like, well, I got a dwarf here, I don't really know anybody else. Because also at that point, when, when I was born, there wasn't really any organisations or associations to, 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 to ask about the questions. So, so I know definitely my mom was very concerned about kind of like, oh, will I be all right? Can I do the things that everybody else do? Will I have a happy, healthy life and all that? So, um, so obviously growing up and then seeing me doing sport and seeing me be able to do things that other people could do what I'm sure was an assurance for her that she was aware that yes he'll be all right he can do these things like everybody else so 
So that's absolutely fine. Coming along to something like the Dwarf Athletic Association or the DAA means that they can see other people that are like their children, such as myself or my partner or my friends, and see that we're just the same as everybody else. We've achieved the same as everybody else. And we can compete at quite a high level in sport. Um, and I know definitely that gives parents a lot more um, comfort in the fact that their child can do the same as everyone. So for a few moments, put yourself in the shoe of a person with dwarfism and you will know the difficulties. But Nicola and Stefan showed us it is possible to overcome all the difficulties and obstacles. With that in mind, we have come to the end of this episode. Hope you guys had a wonderful time. Remember, follow your bliss, live your passion. Goodbye and be well.